Hey everyone, my guest today is Nicholas Padani. Nicholas was born in LA and attended school at Juilliard in New York City. He starred in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child as Albus Potter on Broadway from 2019 to 2020. Some of the things he is also known for include Dave in Summertime Dropouts, Max in Heart of Dixie, and multiple characters in his web series Lucids, which he has written, scored, edited, and produced all by himself. His original music can be heard everywhere that you listen to music. And one of the things we're going to talk about is his series regular turn in the upcoming Apple TV series or on or already past wherever you are when you listen to this in time. Um, but it's called Hello Tomorrow, co-starring with Billy Crudup, among uh, another, uh, just such a group of incredible, incredible actors. I am so thrilled to welcome you, Nicholas, to the podcast. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Hi. Hi. Wow. You had yeah. some deep cuts in that bio. That's <laughs> awesome. Cuts. I just have to say that what has blown me away, I was trying to think like, do I call you an actor? But truly you are a creator. The mm -hmm. amount of content and ways in which you have developed your storytelling acumen um, is so unbelievably inspiring to me. And anyone who says like, I don't have anything to do today, just follow Nicholas on TikTok, Instagram, or any of the places <laughs> where not his, you know, produced by for millions of dollars, Apple TV series are, but just the way in which you have figured out how to use all your incredible skills to make unbelievable stories for people to consume so mazel tov on being oh, brilliant you. i mean after that yeah i'm just gonna retire now thank yeah you. yeah well, wow. that's that's little known fact that's your little known fact well, you're, you're mean, retiring cut and and print um so, no i mean it's been it's been yeah it's been quite a quite a journey learning how to uh uh navigate the the pandemic specifically i mean that's sort of what took me out of like the world of just an actor and you know figuring out how to continue making what I wanted to see on screen with just me, myself, and I. That was a great experience. Well, uh, you know, people just press stop on this podcast and really go look at Nicholas's stuff on YouTube or, or TikTok, wherever you consume storytelling, because he plays, you know, many, many characters and it's so well edited and it's it and it's just another thing you can do uh, when you're not being hired by others. But I want to go back a little bit in time, if I may. You may. Uh, we, will, we will we will journey together. Um, just tell me a little bit about how you fell in love with the arts and when you knew you wanted to do this, not just a school play, but like in earnest as as a, a adult person. Oh wow! Um, I I wasn't much of an adult when I realized that I liked doing this. Okay. Uh, I think I was seven years old, uh, and I was Conrad Birdie in Bye Bye Birdie, kind of like a school play. And uh, you know, I I just I remember the feeling because the feeling has lasted mm -hmm. of uh, the difference between before going on stage and after going on stage. And loving that feeling so much of that of that kind of release and relief and inspiration, just energy, pure energy was was uh, pretty amazing. So, you know, it's uh, that was being an adrenaline junkie and wanting to do theater. And then I think what kind of solidified it was uh, around the time when I was doing Max in Heart of Dixie. That was the deep cut I was talking about in that bio. Um, around, around that time, I was also doing a play in Los Angeles uh, outside of school. And it was this wonderful play uh, called Hermetically Sealed. And it was like this, we were working with a playwright. It was a two-hander. It was me and the woman playing my mom. And it was this great show. Um, and I was 15. And a guy after uh, one of the performances came up to me and he said that uh, he was going to call his son who he hadn't spoken to for five years after watching the show. Because he was like, that narrative resonated so much with me that I, that I want to actively change my uh, situation, my circumstances, my life. And that was sort of taking it out of the realm of like, oh, this feels good into kind of the world of, um, oh, I can do 
something with this, you know, and if I, if I want to do something with life and, and this is kind of the thing that I've figured out, uh, I have an avenue or a medium to do anything with, I'll, I'll do it. So yeah, that's what happened. Right. Like it feels good and I can do good with the thing yeah. that makes me feel good. Yeah, exactly. And if I had just kind of stayed in the realm of it feeling good, you know, at, at a certain point you would just leave because, right. you know, there are always hard days on set. There are always uh, 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 difficult shows where the audience doesn't laugh where you want them to. And that doesn't feel good. And so if, you know, you, you need that, that extra kind of, uh, uh, push to make it something that you want to pursue for the rest of, you know, or, or, or at least for a long time. In right. Your- lifespan. Are you someone who's from LA proper? Like where in California specifically did you grow up? I have a 213 area code. So I'm downtown. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I'm, I'm LA proper. Uh, my parents uh, are both historians. Uh, my my dad was a, uh, a conservator of antiquities uh, at the Getty Villa, uh, which is a museum. And my mom uh, teaches ancient Mesopotamian history. And so when I uh, said that I wanted to be an actor, they were a bit like, well, well I mean, we're, we're, we're already here. Let's give it a shake. Let's see what happens. And I did a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, regional theater. Well, not regional theater, I guess, you know, 99 seat small theaters around LA while growing up. And then, um, and then I applied for college and came to New York and here I am. So what number uh, class were you at Juilliard? Wow, yeah, I was 47. I was group 47. Incredible. Um, so had you spent time in New York before you came here for school? Yes, I was, I, I did a, I did a few summer trips, uh, uh, like for like acting programs. I did one, uh, at Rutgers and then me and my dad, uh, uh, my dad had a, a reason to come out to New York. And so I came with him and toured colleges and we actually got to see, uh, the Waiting for Godot that uh, Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen and Billy Crudup did. And so, you know, I told Billy years later, I was like, I saw you as lucky and you're great. That's so good. Cause on the first day with someone, it's really nice to have something to say beyond like, I'm such a big fan. Like you could get, <laughs> like, oh, oh, I, ha- I have something to say really. Like I really- Yeah, 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 yeah. I've actually, I've, I've, I've got, I've got something. I got something, yeah. Um. So let me ask you this. First of all, are are one of your parents from England? Yes. Okay. Not both or one? One. Okay. And yet, yes. all right. <laughs> okay. I'm going to guess which one. Um, and do I like win something if I'm right or or what happens? Yeah, of course. Of course. Of course. You you, you get a <laughs> free blender. No, um, no. Oh, I need a new blender. I literally just broke one making a smoothie with like too much frozen mango from Trader Joe's. So that okay. would be great. I know. So um, is it is it your mom? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So did your mom come to the U.S. as an adult or did she come here as a young person? She was she came here uh, when uh, she was 11 years old. Uh, My grandmother uh, was dancing in the Royal Ballet Company. uh, Like you do. Like like one does. She is she is this uh, amazing uh, person in my life who I mean, the rest of my family um, are are all, you know, incredible and inspirational uh, in the in the fields that they uh, do, but, uh, my grandmother's really the only one who like has made a living on stage or like, you know, in front of an audience. And so especially recently, I've been able to talk to her a lot. I know I'm taking kind of a veering path, but no, just that's, that's my dream. My... Veering, paths. <laughs> <laughs> veering paths, but my, my grandmother and I just have had this wonderful relationship recently where, you know, we've been able to talk about that feeling, um, of, of, feeling an audience in front of you start to breathe at the same rate and you know everybody's heartbeat is going at like the same pace and it's an unbelievable feeling when you're standing in front of that many people either dancing uh delivering a monologue or or just i don't know what else you would do in front of an audience but sing um for example and it's just such an incredible feeling that uh she really shares with me anyway I love that. Um, 
My mom came over uh, 11 years old. She still has a bit of an accent, which was helpful when she would read me to sleep as a kid with Harry Potter. And she would like uh, read me the story since I was like six. And I so badly wanted to be a wizard. So, so, so badly. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then 11 years after I wanted to be a wizard, I was. All right. Can we talk about what sounds like the most sort of meta full circle moment that any one could dream of, especially <laughs> if they want to be an actor. So you're a, you're a Harry Potter kid yeah. and you know, you know, the world deeply I'm imagining. Yeah. Um, and you grow up sort of, you come to New York, you go to Juilliard at some point. You, you get grow in, up sort of. <laughs> well, you're still very young. I mean, kind you're of. still. I just mean. I saw you at seventeen, Nick. You weren't. You weren't. You weren't that hot. Come on. I'm just saying you're still really young, oh, um, I got you. I got you. which is a fantastic thing, and enjoy every second, my friend. <laughs> um, but then you somehow, I guess, you get an agent at some point. Like, when did you get a New York agent that started taking you out? or sending you out for things post post school. I had a I had an agency from LA when I was like a kid cuz okay. I, uh, I did a play and um Did you do uh, commercials? Were you that kid? Were you also oh, doing I I did one commercial uh that 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 paid me a, a gobsmacking amount of money and um that was lovely but mostly it was truly mostly it was a uh, uh, theater in LA. Okay. And um you know then um I I did you know the heart of dixie tv show and then uh and then a brief uh appearance on a disney show for a second but mostly it was uh the theater and so that agency uh uh in la uh hooked me up with my new york agency after i graduated and they're okay. like we we work in tandem great love them out there and then they started immediately sending me out for all of the uh Broadway shows that were coming up um, and the Harry Potter stuck and it just kept sticking. And it was a bit uh, surreal because I remember going into that first audition and convincing myself that this was just fun, that I didn't want this. And I didn't read the play because I didn't want spoilers because I uh, I had heard that you should see the play. You shouldn't read the play. You should see the play. So I was like, OK, well, I am eventually going to see the play and I don't want uh, I don't want anything spoiled for me. So I just read the sides for Alvis and I was like, well, I'm not going to get this. I'll watch it later. Um, and then it wasn't until maybe like the fourth round of callbacks that I was like, okay, I really, I think they might want me. Like I, like I might not have the chance to see this play or, you know, before things start getting serious. And I remember reading it and just, oh, I wanted it so badly. I mean, you know, if you so read how it. do you I mean, sometimes when we really want something, we cannot calm our body down. It, yeah. it knows no matter how try like I'm going to be really professional about this and it's just another audition. But this was like something that you felt was meant to be yours or that you no, you, no like no. what what did you like? What were you saying to yourself? How are you as an auditioner? Like before you walk in the room, what's your style? What's your audition uh, style? I'm I'm a lot better of an auditioner now, uh, a few years out of college uh, than I was then. But um, I think I think uh, knowing that you're nervous because your body's getting you ready, right, is is a lovely. Uh, way to view things instead of thinking like oh I'm so nervous I'm going to perform so badly it's like no thank you body you're, you're, you're pumping a lot of blood through all the places that need blood like my arms are very uh, fast now <laughs> if in case I need to do fast arm movements in this or whatever it may be you, you know you, you you trick yourself into thinking that this is excitement not necessarily nerves and nerves are a great thing and knowing that whatever happens in the room is uh everybody there is human and everybody there is rooting for you. You know, they, they want to find the right person for the role. And someone who made that incredibly easy was, uh, was John Tiffany. When um, I went into the room and started working with him, I mean, mm -hmm. I will attribute a lot of the, um, the, the, the good energy in that room to him. You know, as soon as I walked in, it was, it was immediately clear that this was a collaboration, not a test. And that was a, uh, lovely was that one of those auditions where you started like as a pre-screen with the casting director or was your very first audition with the director no 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 I was a uh, I was the uh, re American replacement 
for the West End cast that had been moved to Broadway for the opening of Broadway. So uh, the, the West End opened, then they moved the main seven characters over to Broadway, opened it there, and now they were leaving, and now the Americans were <laughs> flooding in. Uh, <laughs> and um, so I, yeah, I started with a, a pre-screen, uh, then a movement callback, then another movement callback, then an acting callback, then another movement callback, and an acting callback, then an acting callback, then an acting callback. I don't know how many that is, but it was that's crazy. that's many. So can you talk about um a what was something maybe the director is 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 who Nicholas is referring to? Oh um, yes, want to be the director. Yes. That's okay. There's one person in Bahrain listening who didn't know who that was. Most <laughs> people listening to this podcast definitely uh definitely know, but are there things that he said to you that really like stuck with you during the during the doing of the thing that were sort of touchstones when you actually, in fact, were cast as Albus? Uh, he uh, was very, very, uh, he was in charge of the audition process. Um, and after the audition process was done, he had a lot of other places to go and help open and audition and all that. So we uh, were primarily directed by a guy named Des Kennedy, who was unbelievably terrific. He was just such a, uh, a voice of reason and uh, groundedness in such a fantastical world, you know, some somewhere that like you can get so lost in um, in the heightened nature of, you know, you're saying these these spells and pointing sticks of wood, and you know, you can get really uh, uh, caught up in all that and the excitement of that. And he was always so very much about keeping uh, the human element of this show, which is a fantastic like spectacle show. But I think the reason uh, why I loved doing it, you know, for, for a year and a bit was because of those human elements, was because you're able to take uh, a, a massive magic trick, one after another, one after another, and then just have this 10 minute scene between two characters, no magic happens throughout all of it. And the audience is as drawn into that as they are the, the magic tricks. I think that's that's the that's the magic of the show, and I think that was uh, the uh, the incredible work of Des and how he kept us all on the ground. We're all earthly beings, just with wands, <laughs> right? But like really connecting and listening to each other and all the things we know to do as actors. But sometimes when there's a lot of wizardry around it. Um, <laughs> I, I know it's a it's sort of a long time ago now. The world has changed so much. We've had a pandemic, and and um, and you've gone on to just do this incredible series that we're going to talk about. But if you can let me stay in this moment of your this is your Broadway debut. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't matter really what who you are, uh, but I would imagine especially a kid growing up doing theater and not. Colgate commercials for the most part. This is the dream, right? You go to Juilliard. How long after you graduated did you get this job? Oh man, I graduated in May. I was I was doing a really fun uh Chris Durang show uh out at the McCarter Theater when I was graduating. Uh like with with Christopher Durang and he's just such a, a incredible man. Um and so I was traveling from New Jersey back to New York to start the auditions for Harry Potter and I got it in October so it was a long long process right um, but not a long wait post graduation it's just really no. a few months no, You're off right, to a great right. start. you know what you know what you're so right back wow yeah no it felt like years yeah but uh but I suppose that isn't that long yeah no there might be people in your class who who would really feel that way mm. um, when they think about, you know, everyone's journey is so different. Mm. Um, so the last question I'm going to ask you about this is uh, where were you when you found out you got it and just talk about like you just got cast in your first Broadway show and it's the world of Harry Potter, which you loved deeply yeah. and knew really deeply. Yeah. Uh, I was I was on set filming a pilot uh, where I was uh, playing this, <laughs> this this very small character who's uh, the the show opens um, with a game of Russian roulette 
and 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 the gun points at me and I have to pick up the gun point it at my head and bam, I'm dead right and then for the rest of the show I keep like haunting the the main characters and everything so, so <laughs> dream so, roll the dream roll so I'm 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 on set and I'm filming the scene of the Russian roulette where I have to pick up the gun and you know all the rest and uh and they're changing out the lens for a close up and I I asked one of uh, one of the runners to uh, 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 get my phone from uh, my trailer and she handed it to me and there were like tons of mixed calls from my agency. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is it. Either I got it or I didn't. And I went outside, it was raining, uh, found out I got it. And I, and, and it was very sweet. My agency said, uh, uh, you got it. And I said, who? They're like, Albus. And I said, where? They're like, Broadway. Ah, gorgeous. Um, and uh, so holding this little umbrella over my head with a with a cell phone, I, you know, cried and cried and cried. Tried calling. Hug, hug mom. a random PA. <laughs> Try anybody, anybody. I just wanted to <laughs> scream it. And they were very adamant on you cannot tell anybody because it hasn't been announced that the like that the uh, West End cast is leaving. So you you have to be very quiet about all this. And I tried calling my mom just to tell her, but she was midway through teaching. I finally got her on the phone. And as I got her on the phone, they came out, they said, all right, we're ready for your close-up." I went, mom, I got Elvis Potter. And they had to hang up, rush on set and pretend to be, uh, you know, devastated that I was about to die. Shoot yourself um, in the head, maybe, because that's the whole point of Russian roulette. And it's a yeah. perfect metaphor for <laughs> what we do. I I've had to do some stuff. <laughs> That's... with guns I hate it so much I mean I yeah. just the whole thing it's I don't know if you had worked with a gun before that but it's always really surprising and you can talk about your experience mm. how it's one thing when you're a kid and you have like a water gun and you're running around in your backyard and it's hilarious and then they hand you like the the real the weight of the yeah. thing yeah. I always remembered being shocked like it's really heavy yeah. And it's suddenly like uh, my whole body would freak out because it just I, I don't like it. And it it just is an astonishing thing to really hold one. Yeah. I don't know if you had any experience with that where you're like, I, this it's, feels very it's, different than a toy. Really helpful tool, because if you're if your character's used to holding a gun, suddenly that's really informative as to how you are different from your character, because I personally am not very used to holding a gun. I, I, I in fact, I've never held a gun. Um but if your character is used to holding it that's a that's a useful tool to kind of relate to then yeah uh, and if they're not then yeah then that's great it's so heavy like for you know that for that guy I mean but that's but that's every you know every prop you're handed every sort of thing uh, that, that, that you have to deal with and with a you know with a wand with a with a fictional uh machine that I was working with in Hello Tomorrow like all yeah. of these props you have to obviously be like oh no I've worked with this every single day the, this wand yep I know it like the back of my head it's They're, my wand those those are mine those two wait what are you pointing at go closer do you, see, do, you do you see those two yes those are my wands I was going to ask if you still have your wands of course I do not only do you have them they are mounted yes they are mounted what what else would I do with them come on it's too cool no, I know. It's amazing. Um, let's talk about Hello Tomorrow because I, I'm i so lucky. I got to see the entire series. Um, what? Yes. Even no though. No way. I'll give you a code if you need it. Oh, um, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I've seen it as well. Oh my goodness, how how amazing. It is really amazing. I mean, I guess calling it sci-fi is the easiest way to just jump into the conversation mm -hmm. because it's it's past and future at the same time and it is um it is so just the design like forgetting how brilliant the ensemble of actors are it's such a like gorgeous production design in a world that they created um I actually know someone a, a man named Derek Stenborg who's a friend of mine who who was in charge of of a lot of the the painting and and the sort mm. of world that you guys lived in um so where did you film it uh, wh where is the world of Hello Tomorrow filmed? Uh, we we filmed on a soundstage uh, in Brooklyn. And then uh, a lot of the locations were Long Island or upstate. So we filmed uh, the locations near my house 
uh, in Manhasset. And it was, I think it, the, the house they picked was two blocks away from uh, the house where Billy was born. Um, and it was a total coincidence. He, he had no idea. He showed up to set and he was like, he, he called his mom uh, while we were in the car together. And he said, you know, I'm, hey mom, I'm playing dad. And I'm, uh, and I'm like two blocks away from childhood home. Uh, so wow. that was for me. Uh, no, wow. I, we, we, we filmed all over the place in New York uh, uh, from November to March. So very, very cold. New York. We were filming a few scenes uh, nearby Lido Beach, um, which was freezing. And is this a, a show that's filming during sort of the height of COVID protocol, or is this yeah. post that? Yeah. No, no, no. We were we were very we were very uh, COVID conscious during the filming of this because um, Omicron was hitting during January, which you know, so many shows were thrown into disarray, and we were lucky enough to. Uh, uh, keep carrying on as planned and um yeah I'm really I'm really grateful for everybody on that set taking yeah it, it was good taking it as seriously as they did and as yeah. as as uh pr and protecting you guys um yeah. was that a rigorous audition process as well did you have to do any wand work or was that a pretty is <laughs> no, was that a pretty lovely I had, experience I had uh so so I did my initial tape um a self-tape self tape yeah it was it was something like 9 minutes long it was such a long tape because they sent me uh three full scenes and it was just a, a massive uh output of material um so i wrapped my head around it sent it off didn't hear anything for a long time and then i think the next yep the next step was a chemistry read with billy and i found out i was going to have a chemistry read with billy while i was quarantining in my one bedroom here uh, uh, cause I had COVID and, uh, and I, and I live with my girlfriend. So she was sleeping on the couch. I was like quarantining in like this little bedroom. And I found out, you know, I was going to be <laughs> chem reading with Billy. And, uh, I managed to, uh, uh, test negative, uh, the day before. So I oh felt okay. God. Yeah. I set up my <laughs> whole thing. And there they all were. There was Amit, Lucas, uh, uh, Billy, and uh, you know a bunch of hidden faces. I Wait, a chemistry that. read on Zoom, basically. Yep. yep. So that's almost like an oxymoron, right? Like, like. Oh, I know. Like, like, so how does that? You're like, I'm kissing you through the screen. Like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what well, is... I, I I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm glad they saw something in me, but uh, but it was. So, do you read with Billy, or do you just chat a bit? Like, what happens? We, we, we did we did the three scenes together. We uh, you know, and and a lot of my narrative in this show is is really deeply tied with uh, Billy's character. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Uh. So, you know, it was, it was mostly just uh, us reading the scenes. And then there was this one moment I remember, I wonder if Billy remembers this, um, where he, it was at the end of the second scene and he looked directly into his web camera lens and, uh, and winked. And I, I remember I thought about that for ages where I was like, was that a good thing? Was that a bad thing? Does he, am, is am he I, signaling? What is he saying? What's going on? And so I don't know. I just, I read into every single thing in that audition. I thought I totally bombed it. I, I was very convinced that it hadn't gone well. And so I let go. And then two weeks later, I got the call that I had it. Now, back in the day before self-tape was how we basically read for almost everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, hang on. I can't hear you. Oh, there you are. When, when I used to read for things yeah. pre pre self tape as, as the way to get a job, mm -hmm. um, for a series regular, we would do our contracts before we went into studio and network. Um, yep. you're a series regular on this thing. Is everything the same except now it's all done via zoom basically. Yes. So, uh, so this is my second uh, uh uh series regular uh yeah. contract the, the first one uh didn't um go through it was a pilot but right uh, but you had to negotiate all of it yeah yeah for both um it, it's been the case that i have the chemistry read or the callback they film it on zoom and then uh they 
send that off to the studios uh, in LA uh, instead of sending you off. Right. And, you know, before the, the quote unquote screen test happens, you know, you have to negotiate the next. So you thing. did your deal before that chemistry read with Billy. Oh, no, I, I did the chemistry read. And then they said, all right, we're going to be sending that off to LA. But before okay. we show it to them, we Got have it. to. So what was nice is that I didn't have the. You didn't have to go to the audition or the self tape yeah. in your COVID quarantine room. <laughs> having with, signed the paper with, all, over. <laughs> with exactly. all the numbers those numbers are heady and it can it can it's all heady right and it's so it's so much time kind of laid in front of you going like so you good with this in you know yeah. six years time well yeah. were you good with that when you're you know 30 and you're like yeah. I, don't I don't know I don't know <laughs> so this is yeah. not a limited series hello no. tomorrow okay no. okay I don't uh, well 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 it's one season Understood, but but potentially based on depending on what Apple and audiences think, it could it could continue. It could, uh, it could. I've already written in requesting it, so you so rest <laughs> assured. <laughs> so oh tomorrow, man, there you go. I did it. Alana between, did between it you, between you and me. Yeah, you're welcome, Nicholas. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about, I, obviously we don't want to do spoiler alerts. And so it's tricky because this is a podcast and it's evergreen. And some people are going to listen to this before they've seen it. And some people will listen to it after they've seen everything. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, the world of working on this show and and what was sort of special about it. And um, at times it sort of reminded me of Glengarry Glen Ross. I don't know if you know that Mammoth play. Um, yes. And then it, you know, it just felt like some sort of, um, Completely. yeah, uh, I don't uh, know, future, a... future Rama sort of thing. Um, oh, yeah. But, but it was so rooted. I thought what was so beautiful is everyone's performing it. It's just like what you said, the person who put you into Harry Potter, the cursed child, it, it's it's like it was so rooted in relationship mm -hmm. that I mean the acting is fantastic. You guys are all fantastic. And it's so rooted in just, I don't know, a, a kind of reality in terms of relationship. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about oh, the experience yeah. of it? Well, this so this is what was really uh, tough about the initial tape for it, and, and, and God, I remember this tape so well um, because it was so difficult reading it on the page where it is written in perfect, like, 50s idioms. And it's next to impossible to read that without starting a little voice, you know, a kind of, little, well, see here, that. You can't go down the street unless you, you, you're right. not gone in the first place. And it's yes. just so... Let me put my fedora on and, and act for you. Funny story about that. Uh, 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 the, the executive producers told us, uh, told the uh, costume department that none of us could have hats because they were convinced that as soon as any of us put a hat on, we'd start a voice. So they were like, <laughs> no hats. Um, but, but I was so conflicted because I didn't know, like there was no uh, tone. Um, yeah given to me I just yeah. had sides and I was like well I could I could do this a million ways and I don't know which way this is going for is it a comedy is it a drama what should right. I look into right and uh I was I was lucky enough to you know I was I was working on it uh, uh with my girlfriend and we you know we were just reading through the action lines before and we we're like you know what? why don't we just <laughs> screw the tone let's just play the scene as mm -hmm. it is with all of those you know me calling my mom ma and, you know, uh, oh, well, geez, mister, you know, all that yeah. kind of stuff. And just say it for real. Like, like it's today. And, and well, to, like today, but like, not like, like those are, those are the words that are so comfortable in your mouth that you just say them. Yeah. Um, and, and thank God I did, because once I got to set, that's what everybody was doing. And there's a little bit of a dialect that I'm doing in it. Uh, very, very slight, just to justify some of those vowel sounds within uh, the idioms and make them yeah. sound more natural. but. At the end of the day, uh, it's just so. It's like it's 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 taking this glamorous, fancy, shiny world, and putting it in the backdrop for like the the humans who still have to you know uh, have hangovers, who still like make mistakes, who cry, who laugh, at the forefront. And so I think that's a 
that's such a lovely quality of the show is is it's it's taking the uh, the ideas of the Jetsons and just making it a backdrop for this intensely human story, uh, one that I fell so in love with while I'm making. sure. I mean, part of it just feels like I keep referencing plays, but like Iceman Cometh. I mean, there are these mm, people wow. just filled with dreams, right? Yeah. And and lives that just didn't play out the way they hoped for. Talk about a death of a salesman. I yeah, mean, yeah, wow. all of them. And, and there are these people offering them hope. Right. I mean, that's what every salesman does. They knock on doors and sell hope to people. Yeah. I and... think that's the, yeah, that's the epitome of Jack. What I love about Billy uh, Crudup's character. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Billy Crudup's character, Jack. Uh, yeah. uh, and, um, and his whole sales team are selling themselves something like everybody has a way of selling dreams whether it be to their partner whether it be to themselves whether it be like they're, they're always they're always trading something and what i love about the the journey of, of my character joey is that when you meet him uh he's way more in the business of of um i think i yeah he doesn't have a dad when you meet him. His, his, his father left uh, when he was a kid and all he wants in the world is that father figure. Mm -hmm. And that's not like a commercial sellable thing. That is a, that is a hole that uh, cannot be filled. Do you know what I mean? And so he's, he's, he's looking for a chosen family. And he's met with this sort of like intense, high intensity, hope filling everything. And, 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 and that's lovely, but it's watching Joey sort of uh, 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 wrestle with what is false hope and what is true, like love. Do you know what yeah. I mean by that? Yeah. He's, yeah. he's, he's the antithesis of, um, of the idea that if you buy a car, it'll make your life better. If you, right. if you get a new stove, your, your partner will love you. Instead, he is kind of of the mind of, I, I don't need any of this stuff. I just need a family. And it's such a roadblock, I think, for um, Billy's character with me. And that's kind of our relationship. Yeah. He has one idea, ideology of life, and mine is the polar opposite. And so watching those two Where uh, they meet. communicate and mm -hmm. intertwine and trade places at some points in the, in the show, which is exciting. It was such a dynamic character to play, and I, I just couldn't be more excited for, for it to people come to out. see it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I have, I mean, this podcast is hundreds of conversations with actors, and, you know, a lot of people, especially on film, which is such a different process because you're mm. not creating a story in order as you film it. And so you don't have the previous scene to get you emotionally to the, the scene you're in now. Yeah. And uh, hang on one second, hang on. Sorry, my husband came in and my dog is very excited. Um, who's, who's your dog? My Wait. dog is Lola. Yo, she just, she'll be back. She'll be okay. back. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um Lola's been here the whole time and hanging on every word and until oh, until Dominic came Lola. home um oh. everyone has sort of a different process some people are like super chatty before they call action and then and then can just jump into the scene some people have to go off and listen to music there's a lot of different ways to get to where you need to go not every scene demands us to be in a certain place but yeah. some do so right. I guess my question for you is working with Billy who's been doing this a really long time um are there things it can you share a little bit about his process and how did you guys work together uh what was going on before on on important scenes what was happening on set before you heard action so much rehearsal uh we we both uh, come from you know a, a more theatrical background and so I think both of us really appreciated um, taking a lot of time whenever we had time off uh, we'd be rehearsing um, the, kind of just lines just making sure the lines were there just making sure that the it wasn't even about emotion it was just let's make sure those are out of the way right so we can really do the scene like if they needed to do this scene in a two shot for one take we could do it 
um, which was a lovely way of approaching it because uh, that meant that there was so much left available. Bef right before the cameras would roll, um, the, the first the first scene we ever shot was from episode three. Um, it's it's the two of us in a car, and it's a kind of intense scene. Um, and it was the first first day on set for all of us. And he was just sitting there, and he, and he was kind of whispering to himself about like just kind of what he, what he wanted, what he needed, what was happening. And then action, he just turned to me, and it was all gone, and it was all down and nowhere to be seen. And I did the entire scene with him, and he was just smiling away, you know, selling me a dream. And it was my job in this scene to kind of uh, 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 be be the um, the rub. The, uh, the obstacle. Right. So I was listening to him playing and all that. And I was, you know, I was just seeing this smiling face and I got out and uh, we did it a few more takes. And then uh, the director was, you know, saying something about the light and Billy was like, you know, can, can we just watch that, that last one for the light? We go back and I'm watching Billy. Meaning, on meaning watching, go to Video Village and watch oh, go to, go to Video just Village, Just because okay. there was an issue with the light. And so we, we went back just to check it out. And I went with, and this is my first day on set. And I, and I watched as every single time I turned away from Billy, he did something crazy. Like with his eyes were just suddenly you watched everything leak out of his soul. And it was, it was amazing. And the camera picked it all up and I had, I was none the wiser. Right. So that was a huge thing I was learning while while doing this show, which is all about um, selling dreams and the dreams not necessarily being what you thought they would be, uh, is is how to convince yourself. You you never have to play the fact that something's a lie or that something's the truth. If you believe it yourself, then that's all you need. And the camera will pick up the moment you stop believing it, and then you have to believe it again. Right. That is all I think that this show is is watching is watching people have little hairline cracks going like through this massive basin where they keep all of the water of everything they believe in. And if just a single little piece drops out, the whole thing crumbles. And it's such a ooh, dangerous game. I had the pleasure of, you know, I lived in LA for a long time and I and I got to hang out with Hank Azaria a fair amount uh, and, and truly one of, I mean, the funniest humans on he's the planet. So, he's so cool. Um, were there a lot of laughs on set? I mean, it's Tons. long days. Yeah. I love that guy. I mean, all of, I mean, Hanifa, Hanifa Wood was unbelievable. Duchesne Williams was just amazing. I mean, Hank was hysterical. Um, he, he told me he hated jokes. He said, I, I, I hate like, I hate, you know, the setup and the punchline. I just hate it so much, except this one. And he told me one. And then after a take, he said, oh, and this one's pretty good too. And so we just started trading jokes for basically the rest of the shoot. It was great. Are you a good joke teller? A joke killer? Teller. Oh, Not teller. Oh my God. Are you, are a, you, good are you a good joke killer? Um, <laughs> you know what I heard? I spoke with some of your friends before the show oh. and they said you're a joke killer. No, oh, do you well, love, that, do you... Do you love, are you a good joke teller? Do you oh, enjoy telling oh, jokes? Oh, when compared to dear Hank, uh, he laughed, he, he, he shrugged and smiled and said, that one was all right. So that's that, you know what, if that's any, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take but from it. From Hank's area. All uh, right. It's pretty good. Do uh, you remember, do you remember a joke he told you? I do. Can, can I you tell on one? Can you I can. On yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Just tell your mom before she listens. Okay, so his, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, a, a man, um, a man wakes up in the middle of the night and he hears this little voice in the back of his head saying, Bobby, Bobby, pack all your things. And he goes, what the fuck, what, what, what's happening? He goes, all right, maybe this is a sign. I don't know, packs all of his things. Leave the front door. Leaves the front door. Get in your car. Get into the car. Turns it on. Drive to Las Vegas. Drives to Las Vegas all the way. Let's say he's in New York. He drives days and days and days. Gets to Las Vegas. Go to the roulette table. Goes. Bet black. Black. 
bets on black. Everything. He puts it all in, all in on black. They roll it. And it comes up on red. And the little voice goes, fuck. And that's it. And I laughed my ass off. Anyway, cheers. All right. Nicholas Padani, before I let you go, can you tell me a little known fact about you? What, what do you want to know? Um, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, okay, I got one. Uh, oh, oh, if my, if my, if any of my high school friends listen to this, they're going to roll their eyes. But this is a little known fact. When I was eight years old, uh, I got hit by a car. Uh, I was on a bike uh, and it shattered my femur, uh, gave me a concussion and all that. And I was supposed to be in, what was it, crazy for you that, uh, that summer, which had a bunch of tap dancing in it. And so I wasn't able to do the tap dancing and I was so sad because I was in this little wheelchair. Uh, and I said, as soon as I get out of this thing, I'm gonna learn how to dance. And I'm gonna learn how to tap dance. And uh, as soon as I got out, I did. And my grandmother was never happier. She was like, well done. And honestly, I do think like all the tapping and exercising and all that made the leg the way it is now. And, I, and I'm all good. Thank you. <laughs> As my mother would say, you are all good, Nicholas. Oh. Um, thank you for being on the show. I can't wait for everyone to get to see Hello Tomorrow and all the other things. What are you excited about that you are working on right now, today, on February 7th, 2023? February 7th? I'm really excited. I just finished a, a, a movie in Italy. So I just got back from that. It was, it was three months in Italy, uh, which was amazing. I was playing Mercutio. So I just, just finished up that. Oh so my that's, God. So honestly, what I'm excited for right now yeah. is, is bed. I, okay. I, it was, it was a, not, not right now, but like- No, I understand. The of things, oh, I'm loving getting to just relax. Yeah. All right. Well, go to bed. And thank <laughs> you for being on the podcast. What oh, a joy to have you. Thank, thank, you, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're All welcome. Right. You're Bye. welcome. Bye.